Okay, going to do two readings this morning. First one from Revelation chapter 5 and verses 7 through 10. And then we will read uh, chapter 6 and the first eight verses. So Revelation 5 verse 7, uh, speaking of the Lamb, it says, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And then chapter 6, please, verse 1, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that ha was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And again, God always blesses the reading from his precious word. So we've been looking at this amazing uh, heavenly scene uh, of this lamb and uh, we noticed in verse 6 that the lamb stood it says there stood a lamb as it had been slain and so again implying uh, that the lamb's sacrificial death is over and yet the victim lives he's alive he's standing and uh, he is now uh, ready to become the king's kinsman redeemer acting to uh, on behalf of God and of man in recovering the inheritance that was lost. And so uh, we see the lamb about to fulfill that. Uh, we also observed as we considered the lamb uh, that he operates with fullness of power. He has seven horns and then fullness of wisdom and understanding uh, seven eyes, again, speaking of his omniscience. And so he's well able to accomplish these things. Now, it's interesting that the lamb has seven horns. When we look at uh, the beast that will come up in Revelation chapter 13, uh, we notice that he has 10 horns. And it's just an interesting observation. In verse uh, Revelation 13, verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And just the thought that ten is an interesting number in Scripture. It's always the number of failure, human failure. Uh, you've got ten commandments. <laughs> you have ten spies, uh, always associated with failure. And so here we have the one who will succeed, the Lord Jesus, and then later on you have a revelation of one who is destined to failure. Uh, despite his efforts to take dominion, he will fail. But the one who is the lamb, he will succeed perfectly in assuming dominion over the earth. And so we saw verse 7, 
this amazing verse where it says he came and took the book or the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And again, what an amazing thing just to think that he is walking straight past these these cherubim who are designed to guard the presence of God, just as they were in Eden. He walks right past them up to the one who sits on the throne. And that scroll, seven seal scroll that is on offer, he he takes it. And uh, as a result of him taking it, he is now about to assume his responsibility. Uh, he's already, as we said last time, he's, he's asked and now and uh, for the heathen to be his inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth to be his possession. And he's about to begin that work. And of course, he's going to open the seals. The seals will result in tremendous judgments coming on the earth. And these judgments will clear out the opposition, the earth dwellers, so that he can come and take up his role and reign. And so he's come going to govern uh, and he's going to reign uh, on the earth. And so the, the outcome of it is, uh, verse 8, when he had taken the book, uh, there's a tremendous scene of worship. Uh, he's, he's about to, as it were, reclaim the planet uh, on behalf of God and on behalf of man. And so notice it says in verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts, four and twenty elders, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So this is kind of the first of kind of three stages of heavenly worship uh, that we're going to witness here in these remaining verses in, in chapter five. Uh, first one uh, is called a song. Uh, it, it clearly says uh, that um, verse nine, they sung a new song. And so it's going to be a song uh, that is going to accompany them. <clears throat> and um, it's clear that uh, much praise is going to be brought here to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb. And we notice, too, uh, that uh, this the, the ones that are leading this praise are the ones who are the redeemed, uh, because uh, it tells us uh, in verse 9, uh, this new song, thou art worthy to open the seals for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. So, so it's the redeemed company that have been caught up in chapter four uh, when the trumpet sound uh, sounded and they're, they're the ones that we said described the 24 elders around the throne. They're going to be leading, as it were, this great orchestra of praise uh, to the Lamb singing this song uh, because of his great work of redemption. And so not only is there going to be that singing, but also we, we notice the emphasis on the prayers of the saints here in verse 8. Uh, the word odors uh, that's found here in the King James is literally the word incense. And so it says uh, that when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials, again, for the purpose of praise and worship, uh, these harps, the golden vials are full of golden bowls, full of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And basically, what it's emphasizing is this, that many of the petitions of God's people uh, through the centuries are about to be answered. Uh, one particular prayer that has been prayed uh, down through the ages, the one the Lord taught his disciples to pray. If you remember, uh, it goes something like this. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, now all of those prayers are coming before God. And in the presence of God, the Lamb is about to enact a program that will result in that prayer being answered. His kingdom will come. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the prayers of the saints, and isn't it wonderful just to be reminded, by the way, uh, that the prayers of the saints do reach the very throne room of God, and they appear there like incense. It's a wonderful, wonderful thought and an encouragement for us to pray and to come and seek God's face. There's still um, that prayer to be answered. Uh, there's other prayers that have been answered. Uh, the uh, the believers are in His presence, and they've they've 
they've finished their course. That's a wonderful thing. And uh, they've seen his faithfulness and, and many answered prayers. Uh, but also there's other prayers. Uh, there's the, uh, the tribulation martyrs. No doubt their prayers are going to be coming before the throne of God. Uh, we'll be looking at some of those in chapter 6. But the, the, the great prayer, thy kingdom come, is about to find its answer. And so he says in verse 9, they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So this, this new song um, is in consequence of the Lamb taking the title deeds to planet Earth. There was, there was an old song back in uh, the book of Job in chapter 38, that the angels took part in and sang uh, in connection with the first creation. And if we just look at the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 7, as they, these uh, angelic hosts witness uh, this amazing event, it says in verse 7, uh, again, the event being the creation, it says, uh, verse 6, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so you can imagine that great song uh, that uh, occurred as God spoke the worlds into existence and, and this, this whole system that we know was made. And so this old song, uh, tremendous song. And yet here uh, we think of since that time, there's very little evidence of angels actually singing. And part of the reason is uh, that uh, the, the fall of man has resulted in uh, the, the creation uh, suffering tremendously. Sin has robbed earth of its song. And now, in the consciousness of a redeemed creation, about to be redeemed by the Lamb, the new song rises uh, from those enjoying the benefits of his great work. Uh, praise is directed to the Lamb. Uh, to him who is worthy. It's interesting that formally this idea of worthiness was addressed to God. In, in, in God as creator in chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. For thy pleasure they are and were created. But now uh, it's the Lamb who is receiving uh, this uh, adoration and proclaimed to be worthy. And uh, his worth is defined in terms of his sacrificial death that has fitted him to take the book and to open the seals. And then he talks about the fact that the reason is because a result of his work, you have redeemed us to God. Now, this word redeemed here, again, it's the, the word that has the idea of purchasing us out of the slave market. Uh, paying the, the, the price, the ransom price uh, to purchase us. And so he came down to the slave market. Uh, the price was high, but he willingly paid the price to redeem us to God by his blood. That was the cost of our redemption. And uh, so we, we just, uh, uh, we will forever praise him. And certainly hear this multitude praising him because of his great redemptive work. And so it also says in verse 10 that not only do they praise him for redeeming them out uh, of this slave market of sin, but also uh, it says, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And so this is the... The, the result uh, of his redemptive work that he's redeemed the people who are now going to act on with him on the earth when he reigns they're going to reign with him and they're going to be kings and priests with him on the earth and it's just a remarkable thing uh, that this millennial reign of christ uh, is about to be, uh, be be inaugurated after all the earth dwellers are removed and the redeemed company uh, that are around the throne, that have been redeemed by precious blood, they recognize 
that as a result of him taking this scroll, the day is about to arrive where they will reign with him on the earth and they will be there as kings and priests. Now, there's a couple of other occasions where this idea of kings and priests is mentioned. Uh, it was mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 6, where, uh, again, it talks about uh, the Lord Jesus uh, in verse 5, uh, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And there, the, the emphasis, the context uh, is the idea that as objects of his love, his divine love, uh, he has fitted us for the role of being uh, kings and priests. He has he's redeemed us so that we can fulfill that role and we'll be able to reign with him. So the emphasis there is, uh, that he's cleansed and fitted us for the role. And then we see it again in Revelation 20, when it will actually be a reality. And we see it in uh, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years years. And again, the emphasis in this uh, particular text is uh, the duration of the reign, uh, the, the period that is in view, uh, will reign with him on the earth for that thousand year period. And so what an amazing work that has been done. Rebels, uh, enemies, now have been fitted by the work of the Lamb to reign with him as kings and priests on the earth. What an amazing work he has done. And so then it says in verse 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands. Again, thousands uh, uh, being the biggest number in Greek. And so he's trying to emphasize uh, how <clears throat> 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, just such a multitude surrounding the throne, the redeemed company, uh, the, the, uh, the beasts, uh, these four living creatures, the, uh, the angelic realms. Uh, what, what a scene. And again, just if we could get this in our minds, uh, beloved brethren, we're going to be part of this. I mean, it's just hard to imagine right now, isn't it? Here we are uh, all in our various locations to think that this very scene we're describing is a scene that we will one day be a very much a part of and entering into and singing uh, the praise of the one who sits on the throne and, and how marvelous it is. Um, listening to the voice of many angels round about the throne, listening, just being part of this. It's just sometimes, a, uh, sometimes you're at a conference and there's a large number and everybody's singing the praise of the Lord Jesus. And there's just something remarkable, something thrilling about it. But this is, this is going to be so much better than anything we've ever participated in. We won't, it's hard to even comprehend how marvelous it is, but this is our destiny. This is something we have to look forward to. And again, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Worthy on seven counts to be esteemed, uh, to receive these things. Now, what a wonderful thing uh, to, to uh, think that we'll be uh, forever esteeming the lamb on these various accounts. Uh, slain to receive power. Again, the one that humbled himself and became a servant and took that lowly place will receive power. Riches, <laughs> excuse me, the one that um, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, uh, will receive riches. The Gentiles will bring their riches to him. Uh, he'll receive that uh, wisdom. Again, the one uh, who, again, took that lowly place uh, will be will be recognized all the wisdom of man that's used for destructive purposes now will be designed to elevate and magnify the 
the Lamb. Yeah, strength and honor and glory and blessing, all these things, things that he gave up, he will get back. His glory was veiled. His glory will be seen again. Uh, instead of honor, uh, he received reproach, but he will be given the honor that he is worthy of and blessing uh, many that have cursed him. <laughs> now, uh, the, the one who has been cursed by many, being used as, his name being used as a cursed word, will be associated forever with blessing. And so every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, blessing and honor, glory and power be to him that sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Now, again, let's just think about the four things that are mentioned here, blessing, honor, glory, and power be to him that sits on the throne to the lamb forever. Again, I suspect that these things are referring to millennial features, blessing, uh, the curse, which has robbed us of so much blessing is going to be removed during the righteous reign of Christ. And the result will be great blessing. Creation's groaning will be silenced. There'll be tremendous blessing on planet earth, honor, the Lord entering into his rightful place, in the very place where he was rejected, where they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. He will receive the honor of the nations. Uh, all will give him the honor. And his people, Israel, will honor him. And we will honor him. And then glory. Glory would point to the presence of God with his people on the earth. Uh, when Solomon dedicated the temple. I was just reading it this morning, and the uh, the glory filled the place. Uh, again, glory will be seen once again on planet Earth uh, in a marvelous way uh, when the Lord Jesus reigns with men. And then power, best seen in Solomon in the Old Testament and the dominion that he had and the great power that he had. Well, uh, this reign of the Lord Jesus will be so powerful, it will extend to the very ends of the earth. And so verse 14, it says, The four beasts said, Amen. The four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And so what a tremendous crescendo to this, uh, this great scene in chapter 5. But this is a preparatory scene in heaven prior to, to what we call the great tribulation. And again, just to remind us, uh, we've just seen in this these four and five chapters, uh, we've seen the church has been raptured. The trumpet has sounded. The word said, come up here. We've seen the lamb has taken the book. All heaven has reverberated with praise and proclaiming his worthiness. Now John is about to see what the Lord Jesus called the beginning of sorrows. And I want to suggest to you that we're going to see a lot of parallels between Revelation 6 and the Olivet Discourse that the Lord Jesus gave, particularly in Matthew 24, but also some references to Luke 21. We also will observe that throughout this middle section of the book, which is from 6 through 19, we're not going to see any mention of the church or churches. And even when we observe those that are believers at this time, we're going to see a very different flavor to what we would see in the New Testament church. Uh, we're on different ground to the age of grace, and we're going to see it very clearly as we observe these things. Now, we're going to look at seven seals the seven seals that are uh, on the, the scroll are going to be opened. And we're going to find several things. First of all, we're going to observe that these seal judgments, when the seventh seal is opened, out of that is going to come seven more judgments. Now, these are trumpet judgments. And once the seventh trumpet sounds, out of that is going to come seven last plagues or the seven bowl judgments. And so I want you to think of it like a, a telescope, if you like, that uh, you've got one, you know, kind of one section and then uh, another section opens up and then another section opens up. So it's a, we're going to look at it from a telescopic 
point of view. Now, it's important to see that, but we'll bring out why we're going to take this approach, because many who look at the book of Revelation see these seven, three sets of seven judgments as saying the same thing in three different ways. Uh, they see it all concurrent. I don't see that. I see these as progressive. Uh, when the seventh seal opens, out of it comes seven trumpets. So we're going to see that. But another thing we want to observe, just a general observation, and we'll point out the details as we go. But we're going to observe that these sevens are invariably divided into fours and threes. That's a little pattern. So, for instance, there are seven seal judgments, but the first four are connected with horsemen the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The last three don't have any bearing on horsemen at all. So you got four and three. And that's a pattern you can see in the word of God. If you look, for instance, at the Feast of Jehovah in Leviticus 23, you, you have seven festivals that are listed in Leviticus 23, and they divide into four and three. Four of them are festivals in the springtime. Three of them are festivals in the fall or the autumn season. The four spring festivals all are, find their fulfillment in conjunction with the first advent of Christ. The final three are all connected with the second advent of Christ. And so, again, we see a, this four-three pattern, and we're going we're gonna to observe it as we go uh, through these judgments. And again, what we're going to say is that, again, God, in writing this amazing book that we call the Bible, just how incredibly precise and orderly, and the patterns are consistent. And, and again, it's something that a human mind, or even, dare I say it, artificial intelligence, because uh, there's much talk about how brilliant this is, could never do this. This is something that not an artificial intelligence, but the intelligence behind the universe has written this marvelous book. And it's wonderful to observe. So praise and worship has been addressed to God as creator in chapter 4. However, creation is currently in disarray. Mankind is sinful and rebellious. How, how could this creation, which was designed to bring pleasure to God, remember chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. And certainly, it cannot bring pleasure to the heart of God seeing what he sees right now on planet Earth, seeing the evil of man, the wickedness of man, uh, the, the things that are just going on in everyday uh, life here on planet Earth. Things are not right. It's not the way it's meant to be. But the Lamb, who has now taken the scroll and is about to open the seals, is about to bring creation back into subjection to the creator the redeemer god is going to do his work and the work of christ's redemption we said we, we tend to sometimes just limit it to redeeming sinful men but all creation is in view in his redemptive work and so we're going to see that the creation that is now still groaning and travailing, the Lord Jesus is going to bring it into complete subjection. And that's the, uh, the wonderful uh, things we're going to witness. But before uh, that happens, there's going to be a lot of upheaval. It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> and we're going to see that in Revelation 6. So notice verse 1, it's just John says, And I saw... When the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this is the first seal judgment. The four beasts are inviting John to view the open seals in the order that they appear. Now, I want you to notice, too, that each of the seals that are opened, these four horsemen seals particularly, are opened by one of the, uh, by the lamb, but, but one of the four beasts uh, is introducing it. So, so just so we can, we can see that, look at verse 3, for instance, 
when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. Okay, so the second beast is saying, uh, verse five, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, okay, so each time the Lord Jesus opens a seal, one of the beasts invites John to come and see it, and it, it, it's one of them individually. Now, we, we saw in chapter four, verse seven, that these four beasts were given a description of them. They're all slightly different. So we saw, for instance, in verse 7 the, of chapter 4, the first beast was like a lion. So the, so the lion beast is the one that tells John to come and see the first seal. And then uh, it says uh, the second uh, beast uh, was like a calf. So the calf beast uh, will invite John to see the opening of the second seal. Third beast, a, a man. A fourth beast, a flying eagle, and so again, we're going to we're going to want to see this because it's it's not haphazard. This is a lesson for us to see here. It's important to notice this. These are not uh, just kind of casual remarks; they have significance. These judgments all come from the Lamb, so He's the one who's opening the seals. Okay, and the resulting thing that's going to occur on the earth is in conjunction with him opening the seal. And again, we've got to recognize all judgment has been given to the son. So he opens the seals. And remember, we said when he opens the seventh seal, out of that's going to come the trumpet judgments. He's the one that opens those trumpet judgments. They open up into the bowl judgments. And so we've got to see this, that the lamb is the initiator of all of these tribulation judgments. That's why they're going to say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, uh, because he's the initiator of these judgments, because judgment has been given to the Son. Maybe just one other little comment before we look at these, and that is, if you look back to Isaiah 61, very familiar uh, passage, because the Lord Jesus, when he read the scriptures in the synagogue, in Nazareth, Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, read from this passage. And he read the first part of it. He read from verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says, he closed the book and sat down and said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But now he's opening the book and what comes next? He closed it after the acceptable year of the Lord. But then it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. And we're about to witness the day of vengeance of our God in the opening of these seals. Uh, things are going to change. The day of grace has come to an end. Judgment is about to occur. That's why it says in verse 1 of chapter 6, but when the Lamb opened um, one of the seals, and I heard, the minute he opens one of the seals, what did he say? I heard the noise of thunder. <laughs> what does that tell us? The storm is about to break. Right uh, the, the, out of the throne is coming these thunders, lightnings, uh, and and so uh, the the storm is about to break on the planet, and so the first one. It says in verse two, I saw behold a white horse. Now, I want us to think about this. The lion beast opens this seal. The beast resembling the lion opens this seal. And because the world rejected the true king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, as a judgment for that, another king will come who is ambitious for himself, the man of lawlessness. The world said, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> and since that time, they have had one dictator, uh, one uh, rogue ruler after another. Selfish ambition, uh, kind of ruling, uh, not really a, a, in a responsible way, 
And it's going to reach its climax with this one that is going to appear. This, <clears throat> this rider. Now, some have erroneously seen this rider because he's on a white horse. And, and um, uh, some have seen this as Christ. And uh, uh, because of the, the connection with Revelation 19 and verse 11 uh, verse through 13, where it says, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And so, rider on a white horse, rider on a white horse, some have uh, wrongly made the assumption that this was Christ. But not at all. In fact, we said that there's going to be parallels and you might want to stick a, a ribbon in Matthew 24 because we're going to be making several trips to Matthew 24 uh, to see the parallels uh, that are found uh, between uh, these portions. And Matthew 24, uh, verse 5, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And of course, there have been many antichrists that have gone out into the world. And we know that. But they're all leading to the end time uh, antichrist, if you like. They're all leading to that moment. And so here we, we see uh, this one coming forth, riding on a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow. A crown was given to him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. And so... We could say this, this is the, the false Christ that will come because the Lord Jesus said, I came in my father's name and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, him you will receive. And this is exactly what's in view here. He will come conquering and to conquer, but not with force. Notice he says he's got a bow, but there's no mention of any arrows. Uh, it would be a bloodless victory. He will accomplish peace by political means. He's given a crown. Uh, he'll be the emperor of the revived Roman Empire. He is that prince that will come, referred to in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Let me just read from Daniel 9 and verse 26, where we read this great prophecy given to Daniel It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of wars, desolations are determined. The prince that shall come. And of course, that, that uh, th those people that destroyed the temple in AD 70, uh, they, uh, it'll be a revival of that Roman Empire in the last days that will produce this prince that will come. And, of course, he will come, and keep your finger there in Daniel 9, and he'll come and he'll make a peace deal. Uh, chapter 9, verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice, sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So he's going to make a peace deal, a peace treaty. Uh, Isaiah 28 will call this a covenant with death, but he's going to make a peace treaty with Israel. He's going to solve the Middle East crisis. He's going to bring our world that is weary. Uh, with war and conflict to peace. And so uh, this perhaps this peace treaty will involve a permission to rebuild the Jewish temple. Uh, we certainly see that in Revelation chapter 11. There's mention of the temple. In fact, 2 Thessalonians says he's going to stand in the temple and declare himself to be God. So his assurance of peace and prosperity appeal to a weary world here appears to be the answers that the world has, the problems the world has. And I think we can see our world is desperate 
for a man that has answers. And it's getting ready. The globalists are getting ready. Uh, the, the various organizations and instruments of, of world power are getting ready to welcome this man. And certainly he is coming. And it's a judgment. It's a definite judgment. Be, again, because they re the rejection of the true king, then this, this one who will come, uh, and he will be the false king, he will come, and as a result of it, uh, that will there will be a total dictatorship uh, on the earth. Uh, he's going to reign uh, throughout the tribulation period. This this once this rider comes on the scene, uh, he's he's going to reign for the whole seven years until he is destroyed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and so it will continue through that period. Now we think about the rider on the red horse. Notice verse three, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now notice that this second rider is gonna take peace from the earth, which implies that there was a time of peace. <laughs> brought in by this first rider and of course we are reminded uh, in scripture aren't we uh, that <clears throat> when they shall see peace and when they shall say peace and safety sudden destruction shall come upon them uh, like a, a woman with child and so that's exactly what we're going to see so the second beast here uh, introduces or tells john to come and see and, and view uh, this rider and, and again the second beast was the calf, if you remember. Calf is certainly a, a very positive picture. Uh, Jesus included the picture of the fatted calf in the parable of the prodigal son, whose father is so overjoyed by his, re, uh, by his return that a calf is prepared uh, at, at a welcome home banquet. And so it, it comes as a, a, a community symbol of joy, forgiveness, and welcome. And certainly is connected with peace. Uh, it's connected with peace in Isaiah 11. If we want to just turn back there, where we get a beautiful millennial scene, a peaceful scene. Prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 6 and 7. It says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So here's this beautiful, peaceful scene. Even, even the, uh, the animal creation uh, in harmony together, uh, feeding together. And so, so the thought is this, that this calf... Second beast representing the one who was come to bring peace to the earth, the Lord Jesus. Uh, he was he was the one. And tragically, uh, Luke's Gospel chapter nineteen, uh, we we read these tragic words uh, given by the Lord Himself, and He says in Luke nineteen verse forty two, it says, saying as He weep, weeps over Jerusalem, if thou hadst known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace but now they are hid from thine eyes so what we could say is this that the lord jesus is the one who came to bring peace <laughs> but they rejected the prince of peace they, they we don't want this one we will not have him and as a result of rejecting the prince of peace in this time of tribulation, peace will be taken from the earth. It, the peace that the, the false Messiah brings in is very short-lived. It's interrupted by warfare again. And again, we, we said that there's parallels with Matthew 24. Again, verse 6 and 7 of Matthew 24, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
And so again, this, uh, this rider, his sovereign mission is to take peace from the earth. And as we said, when they will say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. No, not at all. And notice this rider on the red horse, of course, uh, his color symbolizes blood, uh, red. And also uh, we notice that um, power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And so again, this whole picture is of bloodshed and slaughter. Uh, it seems that there'll be civil war. Uh, they, they will slay one another. Uh, there'll be ethnic conflict, nation against nation, ethnic group against ethnic group. Of course, we've seen much of that through the ages, but it's going to come to a climax uh, during this last uh, seven year period. And so and it will continue. There will continue to be warfare and conflict throughout that seven year period until it climaxes with the coming of Christ and the final conflict when he will put down all of this rebellion. And then we come to the third rider, the rider on the black horse in verse five and six. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, measure of wheat for a penny, Three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So the, the third beast was, again, had that face of a man. Of course, the first man was linked with Eden and its prosperity before the fall. When the second man came, that last Adam, he was rejected. So prosperity must wait until he returns. Until then... Famines climaxing in this end time famine that will occur. And of course, it, famine necessarily uh, is a result of warfare and conflict. Uh, while people are killing each other, they're not sowing and planting and sowing and reaping. The, the, those things don't happen. And certainly uh, black is the color that is associated with mourning and with famine. I want us to look at the book of Lamentation uh, just for a moment. The Lamentations of Jeremiah, and he's describing the, the terrible sufferings that occurred uh, in Jerusalem before it fell. And uh, one of the things that he'll mention in a couple of times is the color of the people because of the famine that they endured during the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, for instance, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Her Nazarites were purer than snow. Uh, they were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage, speaking of their condition now, is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. And so as a result of the famine, uh, it tells us, their, their visage is blacker than coal. Chapter 5 and verse 10. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. And so we see that this rider, black, associated with mourning, associated with famine. And again, our Lord Jesus in his Olivet Discourse mentioned this in verse 9 and 10. It says... Um, Matthew 24, it says, uh, no, that's clearly not the right reference. Um, maybe verse 7, it talks about, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there'll be famines and pestilences in various places so again a direct result of the warfare famine a logical sequence to war and we see uh, not only is the condition of famine condition uh, the rider carries a weighing scale 
I notice that that um, I, it says, I beheld a black horse, verse 5, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands, weighing scales, and uh, measuring out a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And so what we see is, uh, again, that the food is scarce, especially uh, the, the staple of life, right? Bread, man shall not live by bread alone, the Lord says, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this is the staple. This is the staple food and a measure of wheat for a penny. So it has to be measured out. Again, it's like rationing. You're only allowed a certain amount. And uh, again, uh, a, a laboring man could have eaten a measure at one meal, uh, three meals worth of barley bread, uh, because barley is always associated with the poor. Uh, back in Ezekiel, when Ezekiel is telling them about the, the conditions they're going to go through, he eats what we call Ezekiel bread in chapter uh, 4, verse 9 and 10. And it's barley bread, uh, because it was the bread of the poor, famine famine bread, bread of the poor. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, um, oh, this idea of a measure of wheat for a penny, a penny was what a, a day's labor, right? So the, a working man, in one of the parables, the Lord said that, that he would give them a penny a day to work in the fields. So, so it'd be a day's wages would buy one measure of wheat bread, enough for one meal. A day's wages were enough for one meal of bread or three days worth of barley bread. So again, we just see how expensive things are, how rare things are. And yet the oil and wine are not affected, not to be touched. Touch not the oil and the wine. So uh, again, there's a, there's a connection between oil, wine, and bread. If you look back at Psalm 104, we see that they all have different uses. That's Psalm 104, uh, in verses fif verse 15, it says, wine that makes glad the heart of man. Well, it's not for his sustenance, but it just makes it's, it's, it's connected with joy. Oil to make his face to shine. Uh, how he looks. It looks good. And bread, which strengthens man's heart. And so it seems that wine and oil, maybe things associated with more prosperity, will be readily available. But what's going to be needed and what's going to be missing is bread, which strengthens the heart of man. Of course, if the luxury items, oil and wine, are untouched, that will certainly aggravate uh, the tension uh, between the classes uh, because the poor can barely put bread on the table, but there's still luxury items available for the wealthy. And no doubt all this will add to the continuing civil unrest. Well, we just have time to look at the final rider on the pale horse uh, notice again verses seven and eight it says when he had opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed up with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword with hunger with death and with the beasts of the earth so the false fourth beast we know is the eagle soaring in the heavens and christ could indeed lift men to the highest heavens but because they rejected him well what is the result when you look at a verse that has great bearing on this matthew's gospel chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 where we're going to see what the lord would have done for them if they'd have accepted him and his claims and the result of their rejecting his claims he says to Capernaum, now remember Capernaum was the headquarters of the ministry of the Lord Jesus in Galilee. And he says, thou Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven. See, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to exalt them into heaven. He wanted to, as it were, cause them to, to soar like the eagle, uh, enjoying, uh, as it were, heaven's blessing. And he says, shall be brought down to hell. But if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So because they rejected the Lord from heaven, the one who would have gladly, as it were, caused them to soar to the very heavens, the result is rejection of him results in death 
and L. Of course, this rider uh, is described in a very ghastly terms, a pale horse. It's kind of a ghastly, unearthly pale green color is what's in view, like to the color of putrefying flesh. Death and hell followed with him, resulting in a fourth part of the earth, dying from the sword, hunger, uh, death, and the beasts of the earth. Now, again, just, just think about this for a moment. If a fourth part of the earth is a fourth part of the human population. Right now, there's 8 billion souls on this planet. This is the first half of the tribulation period. This is what we call, if you like, the, the beginning of sorrows. It's not the worst part. And yet, during this first part of the tribulation period, 2 billion souls will perish. 2 billion. Now, just to put it in perspective, in the Second World War, the total number of deaths was 50 million. That was devastating. Now think of 2 billion. That's the entire population, pretty much, of India and China wiped off the map. And notice he talks about death and hell or death and Hades. Death receives the bodies of men. Hades receives the souls of men. And again, we notice too, that part of this, uh, the tragedy is that that death occurs on, as a result of different things. Uh, we'll notice that um, there's those that are going to perish with the sword because the conflict continues, and those with hunger during the famine, and with death, and again perhaps pestilence and disease will accompany a famine, which it so often does. And then it says with the beasts of the earth. And again, if uh, if people are starving, no matter how much you think of your lovely pet pooch, um, if it's between me and him, <laughs> I'm going to eat, <laughs> and he's not going to eat. And maybe you wouldn't have the heart to kill him, so you let him go. And they're going to be beasts that are going to be starving, and they're going to be attacking uh, any weak victims that they can find. And so this is a glimpse of what will come on this earth, and again, by way of practical application, uh, it seems to me that the chess pieces are all on the board. And I don't think it's going to be long before we hear that sound of the trumpet. And so for the likes of us, we have an opportunity to warn men to flee from the wrath to come. And we certainly should do that because after this seven years, and horrendous as it is, if they're still without Christ, then there's an eternity in the lake of fire. So this we would not want for anyone, not even for our worst enemy. We would not want this upon them. And so may God burden us to speak of the Savior, the Lamb, as it had been slain, who is now standing, risen. Uh, he's the one they need to know. May the Lord encourage us and set us forth with zeal for the gospel. Amen.